day to be together. And so, Donald, I'm going to ask you to open us in prayer and be sure and give thanks for the freedom that we have, remembering this week and our dependence on God. Lead us away in prayer. We thank Thee, O oh Lord, for the beautiful day that You have blessed us with. We thank You also for the special day that we will break bread with You and give You praise and glory and thanks for all that You've done for us at the cross. We pray for America and give thanks for the Lord for the freedom of the Fourth of July that we have celebrated. We thank You for being here with us. We also ask You to be with Israel, bless them. Lift them up spiritually and touch their lives. Continue to fight your battles for them. And if the, all of those who don't know you personally, let this be a time in their life that they come and call upon your name and ask you to come into their life to be the Lord and Savior. And we thank you. We thank you for life. We love you. Amen. 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 I want to read to you something. I've got a, a book that I read a while ago, and it's all presidents and comments about our country and this is a comment these are remarks that were made at the 150th anniversary of our country which is a hundred years ago Calvin Coolidge was president these remarks were given on July 5th 1926 in Philadelphia and I'm just condensing what he said but I was moved by the things I read. He said, in its main feature, the Declaration of Independence is a great spiritual document. It is a declaration not of material, but of spiritual conceptions. Quality, liberty, popular sovereignty, the rights of man, these are the elements which we can see and touch. They are ideals. They have their source and their roots in the religious convictions. Unless the faith of the American in these religious convictions is to endure, the principles of our declaration will perish. We cannot continue to enjoy the result if we neglect and abandon the cause. We hold that the duly authorized expression of the will of the people has a divine sanction. Before we can understand their conclusions, we must go back and review the course which they followed. We must think the thoughts which they thought. Their intellectual life centered around the meeting house. They were intent upon religious worship. While scantily provided with other literature, there was a wide acquaintance with the scriptures. Over a period as great as that which measures the existence of our independence, meaning the 150 years prior to our country's independence, they were subject to this discipline, not only in their religious life and educational training, but also in their political thought. They were a people who came under the influence of a great spiritual development and acquired a great moral power. We live in an age of science and of abounding accumulation of material things. These did not create the Declaration. Our Declaration created them. The things of the Spirit come first. Unless we cling to that, all our material prosperity, overwhelming though it may appear, will turn to a barren scepter in our grasp. If we are to maintain the great heritage which has been bequeathed to us, we must be like-minded as the fathers who created it. We must not sink into a pagan materialism we must cultivate the reverence which they had for the things that are holy. We must follow the spiritual and moral leadership which they showed. We must keep replenished that they may glow 
with a more compelling flame, the altar fires before which they worshiped. And that was said about a hundred years ago. And yet I would say it's still true today. So for our first hymn, I'd like us to go to hymn number 804. <laughs> Hymn number 804, and I think it's appropriate because our country came into existence through a battle, and our country then fought to stay a country through a battle. So let's go to number 804. When you find your place, join me in standing, and we're going to sing the first, the second, and fourth verse. Okay? One, two, three. to it yet, 
pick this up in the back and it will help you. Okay, and then Gary wanted to acknowledge our country, right? Yep. All right, will all veterans come forward, please? Just while they're doing that, just so everybody else knows, when I call attention, everybody else rise, get on your feet, and uh, when I say you breathe on our arms, put your hand over your heart, and uh, face the flag and say your pledge of allegiance. One other note I wanted to put out that um, I learned recently is that a lot of people don't realize it when he was talking about the Declaration of Independence. The first Declaration of Independence, whether you know it or not, was written by Thomas Jefferson. And it was rewritten uh, two or three more times, finalized by John Adams and all the rest. But Thomas Jefferson wrote the first one, as they asked him to. Just so you know. Okay? And up. About face. Present ours. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the Republic for which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Two. Out face, fall out, take your seats. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. And thank everyone. And uh, I don't say this probably enough, but thank you for your giving to our missionary, Wayne Royce, as you can see, $560. So that was a big blessing for him and his expenses in traveling. So thank you for that. Okay, let's go to hymn number 799. It's number 799, and then I'll have some interesting instructions for you. You find your place. We're going to sing verses 2 and 3. Okay? Throw you a little curveball. We're going to sing verse 2 and verse 3, then we'll greet each other. So join me in standing. When you have your place, we're going to sing verse 2 and 3.
whenever he gives them a signal. What will keep Judas from acting too soon? I think the answer is Jesus and how he conceals his future location at night from Judas until he allows him to know. It seems that Jesus has some unfinished business with Judas concerning his agreement with the authorities. So let's begin to unwrap this. Let's look at verse 17. Now on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? The preparation for Passover was always done on the first day of the festival by all the Jewish people. The disciples are anticipating a normal experience, totally unaware of what Jesus has in mind or what Judas has in mind. Now we know Jesus is holding to God's will, but Judas is holding to his own will as informed by his sinful nature. Even on this day of preparation, no one knows where they will be meeting at night. This location has not been revealed by Jesus, but now it must be. How can he send some to that location without telling others? And they're all in the same group. Let's go forward. Let's look at verse 18. And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. These instructions were given to Peter and John to fulfill. In other accounts, there were some other details added to identify this certain man. And you might say, well, like what? They would enter the city seeing a man carrying a jug of water on his shoulder. They were to follow him to the location. Then they were to say to the owner what Jesus told them to say. And the result was exactly as he intended. Look at verse 19. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, between this morning command and late in the day, I think Jesus kept Judas very busy in such a way to prevent him from discovering where these two went. So all day long, Jesus has his eye on Judas. After dark, they will gather with some very difficult moments ahead. Let's get to that time. Verses 20 to 22. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. And each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Jesus had announced a betrayal would take place two days earlier. But none of them besides Judas ever expected that it applied to them. The other 11 are gripped with gloom, thinking about the possibility of acting that way. Each of them began asking if they were the one with the hope that he would say no in answer to their question. Why did Jesus announce this betrayal at the 11th hour? And it is the 11th hour. After spending the day with Judas, it was his desire to lead him to repentance. Did Jesus answer their questions seeking to know their own fate 
And the answer is, yes, he did. Look at verse 23. He answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. Now I know it's often been portrayed in cinema that Judas had his hand in the bowl when this was said. That's what cinema would have us think. The truth is, all of them had their hands in the bowl with him throughout this evening as they ate. So he didn't make it any clearer to them. They still are wondering if they will be the one. Look at verse 24. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. This is a huge warning of eternal judgment hanging over this betrayal. You see, Judas is the only unbeliever in the group. This is that moment when a speaker warns the unsaved of hell as the consequence for unbelief. Why tell Judas that there is eternal judgment riding on his unbelief? Why tell him? I think because this is a merciful act to warn him of the consequence of his sin. This is no different than God confronting Cain after his disobedient practice in worship. Why are you angry? The Lord asked him. Why is your face so dark with rage? It can be bright with joy if you will do what you should. But if you refuse to obey, watch out. Sin is waiting to attack you, longing to destroy you, but you can conquer it. The rest of the story is we know that Cain refused to repent and killed his brother in an act of extreme jealousy. Well, what about Judas? It's, it's another warning. What about Judas? Look at verse 25. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you have said it. Judas continued his effort to hide his betrayal by copying the actions of the others, with one exception. He wouldn't address Jesus as his Lord but only as the teacher. Jesus told him, your question proves you are the one. And again, this was a private interaction, concealing his identity from the others. Now, sometimes being identified or caught red-handed can lead to repentance. But most often, it only leads to the thought of, I wish I hadn't been discovered. This is what we call being remorseful, but not repentant. Judas showed no desire to repent, or even any remorse over being discovered by Jesus. At this moment, John the Apostle records Jesus saying to him, what you do, do quickly. Now he can do what he has been paid to do, and he exits. Judas, as an unbeliever, has no connection to Jesus <coughs> in what will come next. None of the eleven knew what Jesus had in mind for their Passover meal. But now it's time to show them. Look at verse 26. 
And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and break it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body. The bread used in the Passover symbolized the suffering endured by the Israelites in Egypt. Many died as a result of the treatment they received under that brutal experience. Jesus changes the meaning to identify the horrible suffering he will endure to fulfill the will of God for us. In giving the bread in his hands to them, he is revealing his willingness to undergo this suffering before it takes place. Now, every individual is responsible to apply his work into their lives. We must accept everything he is by not picking and choosing only what we like about him. Let's continue. Look at verse 27 and 28. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. There were four cups used during Passover to illustrate these promises written down by Moses. And here's what was written. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So there's four cups representing four promises written as Moses was told. Which cup did he choose? You ready? He chose the cup of redemption to picture his shed blood. It is on the basis of his death that anyone can be forgiven by God. And we might say, well, well, why is that? The writer of Hebrews writes, we can say that under the old agreement, almost everything was cleansed by sprinkling it with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. See, death is the consequence for sin. And it must be carried out every time for any of us to be forgiven. We could not be forgiven apart from his death for us. And he willingly offered this cup to them to demonstrate what? His intention to do this. And every individual is responsible to what? To apply his sacrifice to their lives. We must exercise faith in his work to redeem us. As the Old Covenant was inaugurated by the blood of an animal sacrifice, so the New Covenant begins with the blood of His sacrifice. <coughs> now the Jewish people believed their long-awaited Messiah would rescue them on the exact day of Passover, like it happened long ago in Egypt. That is why there was so much anticipation around the visit of Jesus to Jerusalem at this time. They also held to the belief that their Messiah would inaugurate his kingdom on earth with a feast shared by all his subjects. And there is some hint at this involving his next statement to the disciples. Look at verse 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And of course, 
he's pointing to the time when the physical kingdom is established with all of his people present to enjoy it. What he will do shortly makes it possible for us to be a part of his kingdom in the present and into the future. And here we see he has transformed this ancient ritual into a new practice portraying his sacrificial work to redeem us. And the ending is one we're familiar with. Look at verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And they were singing from the Psalms. And they were probably singing this very thought from the Psalms. Are you ready? Imagine singing this at the end of that practice. The stone rejected by the builders has now become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous to see. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I can't imagine our Lord's thoughts as he would see that very prediction fulfilled in his life so soon. How he was able to bravely move forward with so much resting on his shoulders is a testimony to his deity at work in his human body. None of the eleven will be guilty of the betrayal involving Judas. But they will suffer their own betrayals on this night too. And it leads for us to ask, well, how? Look at verse 31. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Now this is being shared as they walk together. All of them will be shocked and confused over his unexpected arrest. His suffering and execution will leave them at a loss to understand why it happened this way. He says the scriptures predict them all deserting him when he gets taken down. But he has words to assure them in this troubling time ahead. Look at the assurance in verse 32. But after I have been erased, I will go before you to Galilee. He will come back, and they will be part of the large number he will meet with in Galilee. You see, the majority of his converts lived in Galilee. And Paul wrote that over 500 were present for this resurrection meeting. Over 500 in one place at one time. Now, pride is the besetting sin in all of us. It causes us to refuse to listen and to prove ourselves right even when we are wrong. <coughs> Peter is very controlled by his pride, which makes him susceptible to greater faults in his life. For example, look at verse 33. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. He doesn't like being told he will desert Jesus like all the others. And he strongly asserts he's better than the others. Even if all of them fail, he proudly says, I will never fail. I am the strongest and the bravest. Folks, isn't pride a terrible sin in all of us? Huh? I don't know of anyone who can win an argument with Jesus and be right in doing so. 
what does Jesus have to say to this proud disciple's assertion? Look at verse 34. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter is in for the biggest humbling to his pride on this very night. That's what Jesus is saying. Well, what does he think of this prediction? Look at verse 35. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. So said all the disciples. His pride is certainly talking big and loud, isn't it? His bravado influences all the others to do what? To act just like him. He is leading them astray because no one wants to be seen as weak. Right? This is another sign of pride at work in them and in us. We fail to understand what Jesus taught Paul. And so we're asking, well, what did he tell him? Three different times I begged God to make me well again. Each time he said, no, but I am with you. That is all you need. My power shows up best in weak people. Now I'm glad to boast about how weak I am. I'm glad to be a living demonstration of Christ's power instead of showing off my own power and abilities. And I'd say, boy, that makes a lot of sense. There's no greater illustration of the failure of all 11 than what comes next. Look at verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. This is a public place involving a grove of olive trees arranged into a garden. At the entrance, he commands the majority to sit with a strong implication to pray based on his example. Okay, let's continue. Verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. So he takes with him the three he has worked with closely, and he invites them to join in his prayer vigil when it is needed most. And we might say, well, why does he need their help so much? Look at verse 39. He went a little farther, fell on his face, and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. You see, folks, his human nature is unwilling to do what he knows will happen to him. You see, he's going to become sin. As in all sin. In order to be punished for it. So we won't have to. He will endure the full wrath of God in a way he has never, ever experienced before. He will know the complete isolation of our sin involving his father. Complete isolation. <coughs> but even now, his divine nature responds to overrule his human nature in declaring Father's will must come first. After struggling to continue this mission, he returns to his bravest disciple to find 
crying and praying, right? No. Look at verse 40 and 41. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. His rebuke is reserved for Peter, who spoke the loudest and the proudest. And instead of praying, he was sleeping. Stay awake and pray is a very wise admonishment. And you might say, well, why is that? The Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Peter has been warned about a very humbling encounter on the horizon. It would make sense to pray in order to avoid it. But the others are a lot like their fearless leader known as Peter. None of them are staying away just like him. You see, pride is winning out over the spirit in each of them. That's what's happening. Isn't it pride that says, I can do anything without getting hurt? Of course. How different Jesus is from them in this moment. Look at verse 42. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Now, as we can see, the spirit in Jesus is overcoming the reluctance in his human nature. He is gaining while the others are losing in their individual battles. That's what's going on. Look at verse 43 and 44. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. If his words in verse 40 indicate he had prayed one hour in the first session, then it is possible he prayed for nearly three hours in all. And now he comes to these three the third time to discover one. Look at verse 45 and 46. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. They slept right to the time of his arrest, totally unprepared for what they would encounter. As he stirred them up, the end was much closer than any of them ever knew. Imagine being awakened from three hours of sleep to be thrust into an encounter that none of them had prepared for. Oh, when I wake up and my feet hit the floor, I'm wide awake and I'm ready. You give me a break. And you can see the condition they are in right at that encounter. Just woke up from three hours of sleep. Look at verses 47 through 49. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude of swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Here are some details about this encounter which we might easily overlook. Roman soldiers carry swords. 
Jewish temple police carry clubs. Both were present for the arrest. Jewish men rarely, rarely kissed one another in public. A rare sign of affection was the choice made by Judas to deliver up Jesus. He had not been moved at all by the final attempts of Jesus to lead him to repentance. At all. Look at verse 50. But Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Our Lord's reply to Judas was another attempt to reach out to him to change his course. But again, he will not listen and he will not repent. Peter, in seeing Jesus taken into, into custody, acts in haste as any person prone to pride will do. Look at verse 51. And suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. In his haste to act, he misses his target by slicing off an ear. His actions are what we know to be a vigilante. That's what he is in this situation. He's a vigilante. This is taking the law into your own hands and making a bad situation worse. As this night wears on, the actions of Peter will spiral downward from bad to worse to horrible. How does Jesus react to this demonstration of pride in Peter the leader? He responds four ways. First, look at verse 52. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Vigil anti-actions deserve to be punished because they often lead to shedding blood. And you go, yes, I agree with that. Number two, look at verse 53. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? If the surrender of Jesus looks weak, the truth is, he had more than enough resources at hand to prevent it if he wanted. That's the truth. Third, look at verse 54. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? God's will, as expressed in the scriptures, must come first, not second in life, not second in service, and not second in salvation. That's the truth. And fourth, Jesus, according to the other accounts, healed the servant of the high priest before leaving under the arrest of this group. And I would say at that point, Jesus, well done. Well done, Savior. Well done, Lord. You couldn't have said, and you couldn't have done it any better. You're my Lord. Well, what about this large group assembled to arrest him? Are there any words of wisdom for them? Yes, there are. Look at verse 55. In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber? with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. 
their plan to capture Jesus apart from the public through deceit has now been exposed right to them. He just told it to them. They are ignorantly fulfilling God's will as spelled out in the scriptures. And this, expressed by Jesus, has been expressed to lead them to repentance. He has just called a spade a spade. And it's for the purpose that they'll repent and be saved. That's what he did. And they won't listen. They won't listen. What happens to those disciples who acted like Peter and cried by saying, Well, we won't desert you. We'll stand with you. Look at verse 56. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Remember, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I think Peter learned from this experience and he wrote about it in this way. Listen, this is him writing many, many, many years later. If you will humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, in his good time, he will lift you up. Let him have all your worries and cares. For he's always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. Be careful. Watch out for the attacks from Satan, your great enemy. He prowls around like a hungry, roaring lion, looking for some victim to tear apart. Stand firm when he attacks. Trust the Lord. Remember that other Christians all around the world are going through these sufferings too. Hey, let's summarize what Peter just said and see if it makes sense right here. He said, be humble. Oh, yes. Be under control. Oh, yes. Be alert. Oh, yes. Be strong in the faith. And we'd say, yes. I think Peter learned something. Folks, this is our approach to resist the devil's attack upon our pride. Isn't it when our pride gets stamped on that we come out roaring like lions? I'll show you something. Vigilante. God's will be done in our lives like it was Amen. That's where I want to be. I want God's will in my life as much as Jesus wanted it in his life. And whether it be going to a cross or facing an insult or whatever it could be, I'd rather be where God wants me than anywhere else. Let's bow for prayer. <laughs> I think it's quite interesting that the day we practice communion, we're reading through this passage about Jesus Institute. What an amazing opportunity for us to study and then partake. Father, as we come before you right now and we think about the things that we've just learned and studied, we are quite amazed amazed at how this all is working out according to your will. I think about all the, the challenges to see it happen that Jesus had to navigate. And yet he was so, so, so loyal to your will. He did everything in his power to be obedient to it. Oh, what a what a wonderful example that is to me and my efforts to be obedient to your will. 
and then I look at the group of 12, and I have to admit, I see myself among the group. I know pride has always had and always been a challenge to me. And how easy it's been to let my pride control me, especially in times of conflict or crisis, whatever it might be, as these ones did also. So for that, I would ask again your forgiveness, that I would be cleansed of my pride, that my pride would be kept in check, that I might be what you want me to be. I do pray for all my brothers and sisters here too. Also, as we prepare for this sacred moment of communion, that you would help them too in the battle with pride. None of us are immune to the temptation of pride in our lives but we would ask for your help to overcome. We would ask that you would help us to pray like Jesus in saying, not my will, but your will be done. Oh, Holy Father, we give you glory, honor, and thanks. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If your head's bowed and eyes closed, Beth's going to play two verses of a hymn, and then we'll prepare to partake of communion.
Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Twain, would you lead us in prayer, please? Most bow. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, to know with assurance that his blood shed on the cross pays for our sin. His broken body is for us. He suffered things that we will never understand or comprehend. We thank you for it. We thank you that you have made a way to get to heaven and that you have made a way for us to Get victory over our sin here on this earth. In Jesus' name, we ask. Okay, we're on the fourth verse of number 310.
We'll sing verse 3 and verse 4 and number 312, and then we'll be dismissed. And join me in standing as we sing. Thank you.